Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, on this uh, session for Creative Pixel Live. Today, we have three leading legal professionals from the creative industries joining us on our session. Um, they have diverse experience coming from licensing, from um, global cyber security processes, and from actual production for serial content for theater and for TV. Um, I'll leave them to introduce themselves to you one by one. Uh, as they say, as with everything in the world, they say ladies should go first. So, ah. <laughs> Jermaine, that will be you going first, and then we can progress uh, with Paul and with Ihane. So, how, how, how very polite. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. My name is Jermaine Joya. I am the head of Play Life Company, a brand licensing agency. We are based in Los Angeles, California. Um, I come uh, probably with the longest career in the interactive industry, buying and selling properties really for based on interactive IP. So making games across platforms, mobile, Xbox, PlayStation, PC, um, but that has evolved now into licensing across categories, including consumer products. And that's a little bit of my background, and I'm pleased to be here. All right, great. Um, so, uh, Ihane, do you want to go next? I have to, now you've called me out. Um, so, um, Ihane, um, Ihane Ahigbe, uh, I've got about 10, 15 years experience in the legal and entertainment industries. I have pretty much done everything you can do in the media creation industry. I've run the music label, produce plays, I'm an IP lawyer, and um, now moving into TV and film. So I guess I'm a jack of all trades and I'm, a, I'm an increasing master of all. Great, thank you. Um, and then Paul. Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Paul Lenoir. I am a lawyer at the European law firm uh, Field Fisher. Uh, I am based in the Silicon Valley in California, USA, and my practice is slightly different because I, I work in digitalization, privacy, and cybersecurity, and that's the uh, core area of my practice. But then uh, those areas are all, of course, uh, very relevant to the uh, uh, to the gaming industry because, uh, uh, for example, lots of games now are online, uh, lots of games collect personal data, uh, multiplayer games, uh, uh, and, and so far, for example, one of the interesting projects I've been working on recently was uh, anti-cheat solution for multiplayer games. Uh, I can talk about that a bit more later on if, if, if there is any interest in that. So I, uh, I am a, a lawyer, but then because the laws of each country are different, uh, obviously what I can talk about would be uh, the, the laws of the countries where I have experience, but then I am not uh, a lawyer qualified in, in, in Nigeria, and therefore uh, for topics specifically related to, uh, to, to Nigerian law, I defer, of course, to the other eminent panelists on the, on, on the panel. All right, great. Thank you, everyone, for the introduction. Um, well, my name is Benedict Olumese. I'm the founder of Creative Pixel Academy. We are a local um, nonprofit firm that uh, seeks to train people on gaming in the creative industries area for gaming, animation, CGI, VFX. So this is one of our uh, sessions, interactive sessions with people uh, with, in, the, in, in the global community, as well as any other interested people who want to, person, personality who wants to join. Um, so let me just proceed with the questions here. Um, I think the big question of all for many people to, who don't have background in legal or, or, or in business management is what it really is licensing. Um, coming from the various um, fields uh, and from the various um, from the various expertise you guys bring to the table. Um, so, um, if you could just explain that to us, and uh, why is it necessary for creatives to to have to think about licensing? Paul, you could go ahead, please. Am I muted? No, no, you could go ahead. Anyone? I'll go ahead and begin really quickly. Licensing 
uh, in in my mind, and I'm a little bit biased because I think uh, licensed IP is a big differentiator. The reason that you uh, focus on properties or licensed brands is really to aggregate that audience into marketing efforts, into just being above the fray. In this day and age, it's not so easy to get original properties known all that often. It's just harder. It's not to say it can't be done. And certainly when you start with an original IP and get it out into the marketplace successfully, you're the owner and will be building your own brand. But for many, certainly for certain game engines, for certain t-shirts, for certain retailers, it's a risk averse strategy to focus on licensed IP and reach that audience that's passionate about those particular characters or those IPs. Great. Any other, um, any other view from our panelists about this? Paul, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I, I was going to say that uh, licensing covers uh, uh, different areas and different concerns, and it's of course not something which is uh, 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 sp specific to, uh, uh, to, to to games, right? For example, uh, I'm sure almost everyone has heard about uh, lawsuits in the music industry. There was uh, uh, there were quite a few big cases as well about uh, songs which allegedly are similar to uh, uh, prior songs. The industry as well, uh, there is, for example, uh, uh, th th this lit litigation going on about uh, uh, the creators of this uh, Netflix TV series, uh, Stranger Things, and uh, those the, the creators of the series are being sued for allegedly stealing an idea or, or, uh, after meeting someone at a party a few years ago because allegedly that person at the party gave out uh, the idea and uh, they are saying that, oh, the, 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 the TV series looks extremely similar. So it, it covers lots of different realities. And in the, in the game industry, I think one of the uh, uh, most popular cases would be the, uh, the, the whole scenario about Universal, Su uh, sorry, Universal Studios suing Nintendo over Donkey Kong, uh, claiming that it was a ripoff uh, from uh, King Kong. And if you look at the similarities, well, there are quite a few, right? You have a gorilla, you have a captive woman, you have someone rescuing that captive woman, and you have a gorilla who is uh, holding the woman captive on top of a building. Uh, but then despite this, uh, these similarities, uh, uh, Nintendo uh, uh, won the case and Donkey Kong became a popular license uh, of uh, Nintendo, as we all know. Uh, but then it's not just about uh, ideas which are inspired by by, by others. Uh, I would say one of the most uh, notable trends in the video game uh, in industry now is that uh, we are trying to make games which are more and more realistic. Right? We have an increase in graphics processing power, which is available at a relatively low cost. And uh, for example, in the PC industry, you have graphics cards which offer very realistic graphics. You have the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X, which are on the horizon, and which also promise even more realistic graphics. And, uh, and, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is that because we have this trend towards having more detail, more realism in, in, in games, we want something which is as immersive as possible. Well, you have this trend as well where uh, games tend to need license uh, items. For example, uh, if you are... Uh, if you are developing a sports game, well, the game would probably be much more realistic and would probably also sell more, uh, at least the, uh, according to available statistics. Uh, they, they are more realistic if they include real-world players and the likeness. Uh, it, it's much more realistic if you get to play, for example, a basketball game with a known famous person uh, instead of just playing random player A. Uh, and this is why many games try to depict elements from, uh, from, from the real world. If we move beyond uh, those type of sports games, let's take racing car games. Well, uh, if you want to use uh, uh, real world tracks, uh, 
well, you will also need to uh, you will also need to to get the rights to be able to do that. If you want to use the name, for example, Formula One, and if you want to reproduce the the competition, it's the same. You also need to get the rights to do that. But then, even without using the tracks or the name, well, are you using cars uh, which are based on real life? Uh, and probably uh, that's something that you may uh, uh, be considering because, well, that certainly adds a lot of uh, realism to the game. And when you are depicting something which is clearly distinctive uh, and clearly uh, that you clearly took from the real world, well, it means that somebody owns the rights to it. And uh, uh, this means that you would, you would need to, to be able to secure the rights for that. And uh, going back to the example of uh, a basketball uh, video game, well, I, I mentioned earlier, the game would need to have famous players and, uh, uh, and this means that the, if you want to be able to include the player into the game, well, you cannot just say, well, I just found his picture online. Uh, it's available publicly online on Google, so I can just take his picture and I can do whatever I want with it. No, it, unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the laws do not uh, uh, allow that. You would need to be able to, uh, uh, you, you would need to, to get actually the right uh, to, to use his ima uh, the image of the different players. And then uh, if you're using the, the team, uh, the NBA, for example, uh, while well, they also own the logos on the jersey, and there may be lots of different things that you don't necessarily think about. Even the uh, the design, the graphics on the floor of the basketball court, uh, uh, those would also uh, uh, probably need uh, to, uh, to be licensed as well. And then uh, th this means that uh, th there is a lot of uh, litigation which uh, goes on on a regular basis because in, in many cases there are certain uh, items that people tend to overlook. Uh, for example, I'm, um, I mentioned basketball game. Well, a lot of litigation going on at the moment because even if you have secured the rights from the team, the NBA, even a basketball player, well, are there other elements that you're trying to reproduce? And uh, at, at the moment, there are lots of cases in the U.S. Uh, going on about uh, the tattoos, actually, which are on the basketball players because, well, uh, those tattoos, they are actually distinctive, uh, creative uh, uh, pieces of art. And uh, uh, if you do reproduce them without actually uh, securing the rights uh, from, the, uh, from the artists who designed the tattoo, well, uh, that uh, the tattoo artist uh, may then initial the lawsuit saying, well, you have reproduced something that he created and uh, uh, you did not get the rights to do that. So there are lots of different uh, issues to, uh, to, to consider. And uh, the, the third perspective I would say would be, if you look at it from a consumer perspective, uh, and this is something which happens uh, quite often actually to, uh, to us as consumers because uh, when you look at games which are available online on digital stores, well, uh, there are many games which end up being delisted. They are removed from sale from digital stores. And some of you may be wondering, well, why is that the case? Why would anyone remove games which are being sold online? Uh, uh, it's already there. They already, they already made it. Um, why, why do they remove it? And the reason for that is often because, well, licensing issues, uh, uh, the contract in relation to the music, the content, or whatever, uh, those were limited in time. And after a period of time, well, the, the licensing contract expires, and uh, either you have to remove that content from the game, and in many cases, well, it could be quite difficult to do it. It's going to be quite uh, time-consuming and so forth. So uh, that's the reason why uh, many game developers, they just remove that content uh, from uh, uh, from digital stores like Steam or PlayStation uh, uh, Network and so forth. Uh, right. So that's, <laughs> I guess I'll stop here because uh, I've been uh, monopolizing a bit uh, the, the, the session. No worries. Um, um, your, your, your feedback, your, your, your response brings um, a lot of questions into mind, which we we'll definitely get to. Um, I don't know, Ehana, do you have any other view about um, about this, what license it is. Well, look, um, sorry, can you all hear me? Yes, definitely from my, from my side. Well, I, I think the ultimate thing with um, licensing and anything with IP is allowing um, creators to benefit from the fruit of their, of their work. And for the most part, the, the laws are put in place um, 
to give them the best option to maximize income. So with licenses, basically it's, it, it, it's a time, it's a time bound, um, uh, what's the phrase to use? It's, it's a time bound um, grant of the right to commercially exploit your property um, to, to a third party uh, based on, on terms and conditions. Now, um, these need to be done because increasingly with, um, especially in the gaming industry, there's so many aspects. There's the graphic aspect, there's the, the software aspect, there's the, what do you call it? There's the, um, the story writing aspect, the different kinds of creativity involved here. And each of those um, areas needs to be protected as much as possible so that um, one, you keep on building the industry and two, you reward people for their work. Um, it differs slightly from region to region, but the principles are the same. Um, you got to protect your work, register your work, and then limit the ability of other parties from getting access to and benefiting where they have not reached. Sorry, reaping where they have not sown. Um, I, I think I'll speak more with regards to the developing framework in Nigeria, but um, so far I'm in agreement with um, what Paul said. All right, great. I think this has, uh, um, the responses so far has brought up a um, uh, question I had um, planned for later. So I guess what um, many students should be thinking about when thinking about licensing is about um, developing an exploitation strategy for their content. Um, are there best practices on how this should be done by, by content created? Um, what, and if, do, if there are best practices, if you can enumerate some of them for our viewers, um, please go ahead. I have an example, and Benedict, let me, ex let me ask if this is a good example that you're asking for. I work with a, a game developer, a mobile action RPG developer in Poland, and they are currently passionate about role-playing games, and they are looking at the um, ability to make their own original content and what that means, and they have plenty of story and creative to tell and share, or they're potentially looking at a few Warner Brothers properties to overlay in advance. And so they're going through the exercise right now of what does it mean to either license a very large and well-known IP for their action RPG, or go an original route, or actually examine a few different properties, some more expensive potentially than another. So they're really sort of examining the costs of what it means and the time it would take and the approvals and the, the terms essentially overall, the advance and guarantee that's involved in securing a license, the meaningful back end and the royalty rates that would be due the licensor and to cover all of the aspects, obviously music and likeness if there are actors involved. There are a whole host of licensing issues you would never dare put into a game or a film, et cetera, rights that you don't secure uh, the abilities to use. But so foregoing all of that, there's just an analysis that I think is really relevant for any creatives to determine first and foremost what, what audience, what benefit is made by licensing IP and what bottom line return on investment is delivered by a license or your own original effort. And I think first and foremost, that's the exercise. And there's just an awful lot of experts that you can utilize from attorneys to licensing executives to your own marketing folk that take a look at what they would need to spend to secure audiences who've never heard of your property versus going back to that NBA example versus making sure Shaquille O'Neal is in your, your game and you get the benefit of all of his fans or not. And uh, I hope that shares a little bit of light. That would be my answer to first and foremost what a creative team must do to analyze whether or not they want to get involved in the licensing industry uh, in the first place. All right, great. Um, to our audience who have just joined in, if you have any um, questions, please uh, do send it to me. You could type type that to me, and then we'll get to to share that with our panelists. Um, any other 
a person who wants to bring um, uh, a different point of view to that. Um, can I speak? Yes, yes, you can. Okay, um, I'm gonna speak from the Nigerian um, experience. Um, I've been fortunate to work on both sides as a lawyer and also as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an entertainment stakeholder. And I think one of the biggest issues is, because um, the previous speaker mentioned the creative aspect, there is always a necessary need to understand that this is a business. And so the lawyer's job should also be about educating the clients. Uh, we can speak about the number of people that go into creating the work and how some people do not want to get involved in understanding the, um, the work that goes into licensing and, and, um, and the legal aspect. But the reality is this, you have to put in a lot of your own brain power into making sure you know what you have. I would um, use the example that Paul, I think, I think it was Paul who made it of, um, of a game. Now, if I just take any game, Donkey Kong or whatever, or whatever it is, as I said earlier on, there's animation, there's software, but it's also someone that writes the storyline for the game, because every game has multiple options. That's a, that's a He's a digital version of, uh, of a script writer. Now, how is he covered? Before you actually license this game, have you taken care of his rights or her rights or, or their rights? These, um, the actual software, the, the code, and I'm, not, I'm not a technical person, but there are different elements that we need to look into. And so your exploitation strategy needs to factor in how you, how you balance all these aspects and reward people from jump. Um, things like digital, um, digital right, image rights and the rest come much later. And that's down to, again to individual um, discussions. If for example, I, uh, I'm involved in creating a game and I use, um, I'm going to use an Nigerian example. I use, I use someone like Banky W as um, one, of the, one of the characters or one of the um, sponsors. I do have to work out a deal with him about licensing his imaging rights across different territories. Am I using the game only in Nigeria? Am I selling the game in West Africa, in South Africa? What happens if it goes to the, to the US? Um, these are things that you have to consider. So I think in any exploitation strategy, you also have to look at, besides the back end of everyone's rights, the prospective industries you are going to, the, the territories and the laws that apply there. And this is, more, this is much more relevant now because with the internet, there's the assumption that um, there are no boundaries. That, that's not true. So we, need to, we always need to be very cautious of the unique characteristics to each environment while crafting your exploitation strategy. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, if I may, I, I just wanted to add on to everything that has just been said. Uh, and I, I think the key, the key part here is to, to always bear in mind that licensing should always be part of a business strategy, right? Which, uh, uh, as a game developer, you shouldn't look into licensing just because uh, you think that's the only way to uh, to, to go. In, in, you don't necessarily have to to, uh, to develop a game which is based on a licensed uh, character or licensed universe or, or, or whatever. Uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I, I, the, the key point, I think, is to always do this uh, key balancing and to determine, well, uh, does it make sense to use a, a, a licensed universe? Uh, what are the costs associated with that, uh, opposed to, uh, to building something on your own? And uh, it may well be that you determine that, well, the, the, the licensing makes sense because uh, uh, you, maybe you're a big fan of that universe and you want to, uh, to have a game based on it. Maybe you determine that uh, there is a market for it, that, uh, yeah, that you believe that a number of users are looking to uh, uh, to acquire a game based on a licensed uh, item. Uh, and that's the case, for example, uh, with uh, uh, games based on licensed movies, licensed series, and so forth. Uh, uh, we see that a lot. But then you also have to bear in mind the drawbacks of this, uh, the fact that, well, the licensing has a cost, right? It's not something that uh, that is given for free. So you have to bear in mind the the cost of the licensing. You have to bear in mind uh, the the other requirements which may be imposed uh, as a result of the licensing. The fact that uh, the licensing would not be uh, e eternal, so you, you would only be based on a 
certain period of time as defined in the contract. So it means that after a certain period of time, well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the game uh, would no longer be able to be sold unless, of course, you renew the license. But then uh, does it make sense at that stage after a few years to renew the license because the, uh, the, the volume of the sales may not be enough to justify the licensing costs and so forth. So it's really a... Uh, a, a market, uh, a risk-based approach that, uh, that that you have to take, and uh, as a result, we see game developers taking either approach based on their own uh, uh, assessment. Uh, I'd love to just add one thing onto what Paul has just said mm -hmm. too. Not anything to do with the game, but we're seeing retailers right now, especially in these COVID-19 times. Um, all of a sudden, very risk averse. They made a lot of bets on feature films that have now been pushed out to 2022. So there is, there's so much that should go into determining whether or not a license is valuable for a t-shirt, a video game, or any effort for that matter. It's an interesting time. Wow. Yes, um, thank you, thank you. I think um, one of this, um, the, the issues this shows up again, Australia, if you're looking about um, geographical territory and practices and various practices in different parts of the world, um, is there, a, uh, is there a, a particular process by geographic territory for filing for licenses um, for, 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 the, for film, games, and, and, and movies, for instance? Because I know different different territories um, do have different practices, um, so I I don't know if um, for copyright it's it's similar practices or they are different um, by the laws. So who are you asking? Everyone, anybody can answer at any time, please. <laughs> can I just yeah, yeah. The the fundamentals of copyright um, law and regulation are the same everywhere. Most regions have, uh, most countries have their own, um, what do you call it, um, I guess, regulatory bodies. So depending on what you're going through, it's, the thing about, about copyright is, by definition, copyright exists once something is created and publicly performed. Um, but it's always in the interest of the creator to register it because then it's, 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 it's not like quote unquote, um, known just to the creator and also protects you from um, encroachment. Um, in Nigeria, pretty much everything is done under the Nigerian Copyright Commission and the process is very simple. You take a sample of the work, a finished sample of the work. If it's a, it's a script or a game, or you take a finished version of it, you fill in the necessary forms, you pay, you, you pay the fine, um, <laughs> not the fine, you pay the fee and then it gets entered into a registry and you get a, a what do you call it? You get a, um, proof of registration. Now, I tend to advise um, clients to also register your property with, with, um, with WIPO because it's, it's, it's international and so it's just one, one more um, um, step in the process, but pretty much it should be the same thing everywhere in the world. Find the necessary um, authorities, supply the work, uh, the proof of concept, pay the necessary filing fees, and there you go. And then you, I guess you wait for somebody to encroach on your on your rights, and you trigger a claim against uh, copyright infringement. All right. If I am wrong, please let me know. <laughs> In case if any other person has um, a different uh, process that, that is, is being practiced in the art territory, please do, do let us know about that. Um, I won't um, address what Ikane says about copyright. I'm only taking it from the brand licensing perspective. So say you take MotoGP, Formula One motorcycle racing, and you take a look at um, development of a, of a game based on that IP, most companies like MotoGP or Warner Brothers would ask the developer uh, by territory what numbers or units would be forecast for that territory. So technically, if uh, they didn't see that you were going to exploit a brand in um, African territories versus European territories versus U.S. territories. You might only pay for those territories that you plan to exploit.
exploit a license through. So that's just an exercise in forecasting by specific territories. And there are an awful lot of contracts that we ultimately would write, use it or lose it. You know, you can ask for the world, but if you don't exploit rights in a certain territory, then you would lose those rights necessarily, and they could be granted uh, to someone else. Uh, it's taking a different perspective from the copyright concern, but it's just another view of territory specific licensing of brand IP rights. Hope that helps. All right. Um, Cole, do you have uh, do you have any opinion on this? Uh, no, no, I I fully agree with uh, what the panelists have have just said. Okay. Um, so what is clear now from what, what I can get is that um, it seems as if if a first to file a copyright, um, actually the, the, any organization who is first to file their copyright seems to be the winner um, in the long term. Um, what are the sort of implications for for companies, uh, local indies who who are dealing with first to file rights with um, a different IP? Um, Paul, you could you could go ahead with that. Uh, your mic is off. Your mic is off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, uh, I, I would say. Maybe taking a, a step back, uh, I, I think the key issue as well for, uh, for, for a number of developers would be to actually look at what content uh, can actually be, uh, be be protected as well. Because licensing is not only the issue of uh, uh, what uh, content that you want to use, uh, content made by others, but licensing is also, well, I have developed uh, something. Uh, I have developed a concept for a game, and I think this is uh, this is valuable. And I also want to get protection for my own uh, uh, for my own game, right? And that that's where it, it, things get uh, uh, quite quite tricky. And the reason why I want to talk about this is that it, it's often something which um, I, I think this is relevant, you know, really to to every everyone, to every game developer, even those who choose to make the game uh, without using any licensed character. You know, the the key point would be, well, what can you, as a game developer, what can you protect? And uh, the uh, the good news is that there are lots of things that you can actually protect. Right? You can protect, of course, the overall uh, the, the the finished game, but then. Uh, there are a number of things that uh, that also receive uh, uh, protection. For example, have you developed uh, specific uh, characters? And if, if if that's the case, well, those specific uh, characters they can be protected, but to a certain degree. Uh, remember, Leah, I mentioned the issue about uh, King Kong and and Donkey Kong being ruled uh, to be separate uh, uh, separate characters. So uh, the the issue is that for characters, uh, you you can get protection, but you need to be able to show that uh, if someone is copying your idea, or otherwise if you inspire yourself from others, you have to be able to show that uh, while the, the the character is sufficiently different uh, from the original uh, uh, from the original creative piece of art. For example, if you want to have a game and you Reproduce. I don't know. Uh, I'm just giving any random example here. If you reproduce uh, Disney, uh, Disney princesses, or whatever, well, those are clearly uh, uh, in inspired from, uh, from from Disney movies, and therefore, well, uh, you would need to, to get a license for that. But then, if you decide, well, let's do a game, and um, there may be some similarities. For example, you say, well, you're going to have a princess, and then uh, they may be living in a castle. They may be doing this and that, and you start to build your own uh, your own story, and you, uh, if you manage to do to, to do that, then it would mean that uh, the the character that you created would be sufficiently distinct uh, from the original one, and this would mean that uh, yeah, it, it would be a separate character. And then uh, the music as well. Uh, the, the same goes for the music. Of course, uh, you may get some inspiration from here and there or whatever, but then it needs to be sufficiently distinct. It needs to be uh, clear that uh, 
this is a completely different soundtrack. And the, the, the issue, of course, would be, well, what is the risk of confusion uh, for, uh, for, for users if, they, if by listening to your soundtrack, they think, oh, this is uh, probably done by this artist or whatever, and, and it's not, well, probably means that uh, it, it's, it's too close. Uh, Storyline as well, uh, if you have a specific story that could potentially be protected. Uh, uh, but then, and, and this is where things get a little tricky as well, is that you cannot protect general ideas. So if you just have um, a, a story about a hero saving a princess from a dragon, well, uh, that's very general and uh, anyone can, can, can do it. But then if you start to, <clears throat> to, to come up with a very detailed story about, uh, about this character and he's doing this and that, then that would likely uh, be protected. And then game concepts as well. This is something which uh, has uh, drawn, drawn a lot of uh, attention lately. For example, if you dev develop a new type of uh, multiplayer game, a battle royale game, and you say, well, this is the concept. You're going to have X number of players who are uh, jumping down to a, to a specific geographical area, and then they have to battle the, uh, with each other until only one surviving player remains. Well, uh, that's a concept which uh, was uh, quite new uh, uh, re recently, but then you've, you have now so many different games which reproduce this concept. And you may be wondering, well, how is it possible? Uh, uh, the reason for that is that uh, you can, of course, protect certain ideas and certain concepts if they are specific enough, but then as long as uh, it, it becomes quite a generic, you cannot, uh, uh, you, you cannot protect it. And that's the reason why you have many multiplayer games uh, these days which resemble each other. Um, um, sorry, I, I know I've, I've gone on again uh, uh, making this long uh, 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 presentation, so I'm going to give back uh, the, uh, the, the mic to someone else. All right, that's fine. I mean, this, this is a learning session, so um, anybody here who sees this video is going to learn a lot from this. So um, any other view from any of our panelists? Nihane? Um, I think one thing to worry about is, is as, a, as a legal practitioner, is looking for every possible problem that may exist. And the way the law, the way the law evolves with regards to IP every day is, is fascinating. Um, I, was, I was listening to what Paul said about gaming and different characters. And for some funny reason, um, the bloodlines copyright came out. And it was interesting that mm. traditionally, we assume that, I mean, copyright law pretty much, you cannot copyright an idea, it's an expression. Yet, if you actually follow that case, the, that defense wasn't, um, wasn't held to apply with regards to the, copy, to, to the, blood, to the bloodlines um, um, lawsuit filed by the Marvin Gaye estate. Now, with regard to gaming, for example, if you are using a character who bears a resemblance to a, a famous person or somebody that maybe the creator knows, um, what are the legal implications for doing that? I, I bring this up because it's, it is very important that creatives always stay abreast of, or rather not, always educate themselves on their potential problems because there's a lot of, um, as, I guess an assumption by creative people that you know what, little things can be excused away because it's, it's, it's a creative process, but the law increasingly, because the law is meant to serve business, increasingly comes on the side of what makes the money for, more, I mean, um, for the industry. And, and it's, it's increasingly, to my mind, does less for creatives unless they protect themselves. So if you're talking about multi-party, multiplayer um, games, multi-character, uh, what do you call it? There was a phrase that Paul used, I think it's important that in creating every single one of these characters, you make sure that there isn't even the hint of an infringement on somebody else's copyright, right down to that digital representation. Um, I mean, we see this in football all the time where um, sports stars, especially football players, sign contracts and then they sign off their digital um, image rights for periods of time during the contract. That's how you have your, 
your FIFA sport, your, um, your TV commercials and everything else that exploits um, the images, they are paid a lot of in advance as part of their contracts. So with the gaming industry, you have to make sure that every single aspect of the creation process is documented, is signed off on, and is protected. The voices you use, the, 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 the catchphrases you use, the, you know, because increasingly these are areas of, um, of, of for revenue. Um, I don't know if anybody here is a boxing, is a boxing fan, but there's a guy called Michael Buffer who has this catchphrase, let's get ready to rumble, which he, he trademarked. And that's made him $400 million. So any game, you hear that phrase. If it's not his voice, you have to pay him for that. Now, the applications in gaming, for example, and in gaming advertising. So we increasingly look at the, at the wider ecosystem to see what can be done. And it's, <laughs> it's um, not easy, but then again, that's where lawyers make their money. And that's where creatives lose theirs. All right. Um, uh, Germaine, do you have uh, any opinion on that? By the way, your mic is off, Germaine. Thank you. I think that is such a fascinating conundrum for creatives these days. I think the idea that some music writers, some film and feature film writers, and some video game writers probably want to shield themselves from the world outside so they can try to create something original and not be uh, not, not even try to get inspiration from anything, and yet then have to be really careful that what's in a psyche or even subconsciously something that they've created isn't the underlying work of someone else. It is, it is a conundrum, without a doubt. And again, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of here as licensing support to a certain extent and feel like uh, this, this does make sometimes the use of existing intellectual property almost more attractive in some ways. Because sometimes if you are so um, inspired or you, are, uh, you can obviously see strains of another property, of an existing property in the potential creation of what you want to make on your own. Sometimes it can make sense to simply speak to and address licensing that IP in all of its forms for your IP. But it's really fascinating what you said and, and does and must keep lots of attorneys up all night long who want to protect their clients with how best to do that when they have very creative clients. Right. Um, so, uh, I love... Hey. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, if I may, I wanted to add on uh, to this because in, in many cases, even though as a creative, you try to come up with your own, uh, your own story, uh, the issue often arises, well, how close are you to uh, to the real world? Uh, because let, let's say, for example, you decide to create, uh, I don't know, a first-person uh, shooter game. Well, uh, you could have a game which is futuristic, uh, and in which case it's much easier for you to depart completely from reality. But then if you decide to do something historical, for example, let's say you want to do a game based on World War II or whichever modern conflict, well, Chances are that uh, you, you, you may be looking to use real-world weapons. Maybe you're going to use real-world vehicles and so forth. And uh, again, lots of uh, lots of potential issues which which arise. And uh, there has actually been uh, litigation as well in this area. For example, I'm thinking about uh, uh, the Call of Duty uh, uh, lit litigation, which has arisen because, well. Uh, the, the the game developers uh, what they did was that they used the uh, the, the same vehicles as, as was uh, used uh, during uh, uh, during those conflicts they used the Humvee vehicle and what happened was that the car manufacturer uh, most likely because they saw that uh, the game was doing uh, very well uh, they decided to then uh, sue a few years later uh, the game developers saying well 
you reproduced our vehicle in the uh, in, in the game, and uh, you did not uh, uh, you, you did not get any license. Uh, we did not give you the right to, to to exploit this. And uh, what happened was that this litigation went on for quite a bit, and then. Uh, fortunately, for the uh, for the game developer, the judge found that well, in this specific case, well, if you want to reproduce uh, and to be as accurate as possible, uh, 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 an existing modern conflict, well, of course, it means that you have to reproduce as well uh, the, uh, the 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 vehicle. So in this case, uh, the the judge uh, found in favor of the uh, the game developer, but then. This doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you can now go ahead and reproduce uh, vehicles or whatever in your game. The case was quite uh, uh, quite limited in scope, and uh, it's unclear whether uh, another judge in another uh, in another district or in another country would be ruling the, the, in the same way. So, just just be careful uh, uh, in relation to what you do. And Another point that I wanted to add as well is the fact that uh, um, in, in many cases as well, uh, you, you may want to protect the idea of a game, but then uh, if you look, for example, at the, the website of the U.S. Copyright Office, it clearly says, and I quote, copyright does not protect the idea for a game, its name or title or the method or methods for playing it, nor does copyright protect any idea, system, method, device or trademark material involved in developing, merchandising, or playing a game. So, so, so there you go. Uh, the, you, you actually have as well uh, clear uh, in, in indications as well that uh, even though you, you, you come up with a brilliant game concept like Battle Royale or whatever, well, it's not uh, something that you would be uh, th th that you would be able to protect. So uh, 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 you you have to be aware of this. But you'd agree, Paul, that in the Call of Duty example, if your game concept is a, a war game or a shooter, and you're going to use known vehicles, you can secure the license rights to those vehicles ahead of time. You don't have to wait to see if you're sued you can fully agree yes exactly that's yeah. ex exactly that would be the the, the preferred approach of course uh, right. uh and, and just to to add some color to to what i said as well uh uh there were actually some prior discussions as well between the game developer and the and, and the car manufacturer and uh, uh at that time at least it didn't seem like there was going to be an issue but then uh Things change o o o over time, and th there were a number of factual uh, elements which uh, uh, which helped sway the judge towards this decision. But then uh, it's unclear whether, uh, in a normal case, whether uh, uh, that's going to be the, the, the same outcome. All right, actually, uh, I think this oh, Sorry. Yeah, you, I think you can go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Hello, Ihana. Um, I think the there's there's the polarity test in um, for copyright, and my assumption was that yes, you can argue that um, there's a real, there's a realism aspect to it and, and all that, but at the end of the day, there is still an existing rights holder, just a rights holder. I just honestly believe that we should not use that case as a precedent because I don't think it will apply going forward, and even and even if anyone wants to allow it going forward. The, I mean, people now know what to do, as um, as I pointed out, they were having conversations. They could have found a better way of doing this. They just really rolled the dice and got lucky. But again, I, I come back to the point about the law exists to protect business. It is always easier to, while you are making your art, make sure every element is checked. And I agree that I've worked with creatives for, for, for a long time, so I understand the, the the need to um, get so carried away with what you are creating because there's an element of, I won't say arrogance, but there's this, I am doing something for the world to see. It's easy to fall in love with what, what you are creating and you don't, want the whole, you don't want reality to intrude on what you are doing. But when rubber hits the road, you will come across the real world. And I think it's going to be increasingly difficult for creatives to get by on this, well, I didn't know, and well, there's, a, there's an overall benefit 
from my creativity without really paying the piper his due, which is why I keep emphasizing that from, ba from base one, make sure everybody involved in the process is documented. Every aspect is written down, cross-checked, and signed off on. Because it's also easy to have somebody wake up a decade from now when something has been done and say, oh, well, this didn't happen, and I want my money because I never licensed you, for example, the right to use this. There's an ongoing case actually in the Nigerian industry right now with a label with regards to um, one of the trademark references, a vocal reference that was never cleared because there was no contract with the lady who gave, who voiced the reference. And it was as simple as well, there was argument that, well, you were, there was, there was a work for hire and the counter was like, actually, no, I was, I, I was working for hire in this department, but I was not a vocal artist um, for a cash trade reference. And it's, it's a back and forth thing that's still going on behind the scenes. And it comes down to you guys did not do your due diligence. And I really think it's important that creatives, especially with, 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 the, with the internet giving so much information, get to that crucial aspect of protecting their business because once you make money or you intend to make money from your creativity, you are in the creative business. So think like a business person. And he who doesn't secure his business will lose a business. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I fully agree. And, and I think that the, 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 there's a reason why I stress many times that the, the decision, the, the Call of Duty decision, uh, it's a very factual based and uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, it can be extended to other uh, other scenarios especially because uh, when we if I take another example uh, we have this popular multiplayer game Fortnite uh, and one of the key maybe not key but one of the characteristics of the game is that uh, you have certain uh, for example if you're winning you can have certain uh, because you have lots of uh, different uh, real-world uh, uh, artists who said, well, the dance move, which is appearing in the game, it was actually a dance move that I, that I performed, uh, and which, is, which is famous. Uh, it's an iconic dance that I did, for example, in a TV series or in a, or, or, or in a movie or whatever. And this is, this is clearly me. It's not some generic dance. It's something that people know it's, um, it's mine. And, Lots of litigation going on uh, in, in in relation to those, and it, if anything, it doesn't matter actually uh, how the, the the cases proceed. But then, as a game developer, surely you don't want uh, to have to be spending your time uh, lit litigating or, or defending lit uh, yourself from from litigation. You know, it's it's distracting and lots of cost involved uh, uh, and, and so forth. So of course. Uh, regardless of how those uh, cases go, uh, because it's going to also depend on specific facts of the case. I, I think it's important that uh, people bear in mind that, well, this is an area which is uh, 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 controversial and therefore I should take all precautionary measures to avoid uh, falling into those, uh, uh, in, into those issues because it, it, I mentioned facts, but then just because a case had a certain outcome doesn't necessarily mean that another case would have the same uh, outcome. It, again, it clearly revolves on the facts and you may not be as lucky uh, or as uh, well uh, lawyered as uh, those uh, game developers like uh, Activision in the case of Call of Duty or Epic Games in the case of Fortnite. Okay. Sorry. Um, if I, if I, okay. All right. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ihana, please. Yeah. Um, in the Fortnite, um, the Fortnite lawsuit, uh, my, my son plays Fortnite, so I have to suffer it. I, I, I think you're referring to the Carlton Dance lawsuit? Uh, there's this one, and then there are, there are also quite a few others as well. Uh. Hmm. Uh, well I'll use the Carlton Dance because and, and again, it, it, it's funny because um, I guess I come more from the creative aspect, not just the gaming aspect. Um, but again, in that case, Alfonso Rivera Carlton from the Fresh Prince was found not to be able to copyright um, to sue NK2, whatever the gaming company was, 
for using his dance, which was very popular and clearly identified with him. And there was a very, for me, there was a very simple reason. When he created the dance, he didn't register it. Again, it's a 20 year old dance. And what you've seen is that somebody has done something that reminds you of something you created and is trading up your, your popularity. For me, his mistake was the minute he did that, he didn't register it. Second of all, he didn't register it either in conjunction with or with the knowledge of NBC who owned the Fresh Prince. Now I'm drawing all these, um, th these strings because this is the thing with copyright. There are so many aspects involved that you can never, you can never quite fully protect anything. And with gaming, it's going to keep happening because as the Fortnite grow up, as role playing gets more and more um, universal, you're going to have billions of players across hundreds of countries involving different iterations. And I think the challenge for lawyers is now something that was brought up earlier on. How far do we push the extent of international registration to at least give you a fighting chance of protecting your rights with your games? If I'm playing a game in Lagos with somebody in China and we infringe on, 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 on copyright by, by somebody in Dubai, who is protected? How do you protect all that? And who are the, so for me, it's, again, from a legal perspective, as a lawyer, it's, it's, it's fascinating because there's money in it. But for, but for creatives, it's something that they really should be looking at at every stage. Uh, all right. Um, all right, thank you, Ihane. Um, so I think what's clear, I hope you guys can still hear me. So what is, the, what is clear, what I can get from, from the responses is that uh, seems as if there are certain class items in general that uh, we refer to um, when talking about um, protecting um, indies and their games and, and, and films and animation. Um, is there a general class rule as regarding what sort of copyright should be filed? And um, also, again, another question this brings to mind is uh, at what stage should uh, any studio, whether involved in film game or in an animation, at what stage should they um, seek to file copyright? Is it at the beginning or when they're just thinking about their concepts or at the end of production? At what stage should um, that sort of, um, that, that sort of um, uh, process should be, should be, uh, should be um, embarked on? Paul, you could go ahead and first, please. Hello, Paul? Hello? Okay, Jermaine, please, can you go ahead? Uh, I, you know what, I'd, I'd love to leave this particular question to the attorneys. <laughs> on the call as okay. opposed to me okay um Ihana, please if you if you mind you can you could take the question okay um i would always say from the beginning and it's it's a simple thing you can start from the beginning and at, at every stage you can amend your filing so the very first thing would be this um you have an idea for a game so you can there are three aspects. There's a the trademark aspect, which is pretty much the physical, the physical likeness of the creation. There's, there's the basic copy, which is the, which is the expression of your idea. And then if there's anything that involves science and technology, there's a patent aspect. Now, patent doesn't really apply to games, so let's leave that, leave that alone. It's about the copyright and your trademark. So I would say, I have an idea for a, for a game. I've given you a title. It involves this, this, this. There's, there's a blueprint for that game. Call it your script, your, I'm not a gaming person, but call it your, your blueprint for it. Get a copy of that. File that with the authorities. As you build on that, you file other things. You can always come back and put everything into one composite document, but it's always best once you finish the idea itself, once you actually created the game, take a copy of that and drop it off. 
Um, some people argue about whether or not the software should be bought. So that's a patent issue. I'm not quite, I don't necessarily advise that because at least over here in Nigeria, we can't, we, we, you know, at the point where we, we patent um, software, um, software, so I would leave that alone. And then once you're done with the finished product, this is where your money comes in, really. Um, you, you trademark it. Because if you have a game that doesn't have a distinctive look, right, it could be any game. So you trademark it. So for example, um, I can't do anything in sports that has anything that even remotely resembles a Nike swoosh. That's a trademark. You know, I do anything with that, unless I'm doing it for all of the um, public commons and parody exceptions, Nike will come after me. Because I'm basically benefiting from association with something that I didn't invent. invent. So, so some of the I'm doing a bit off tangent. The minute you finish your work, register it. Even to, if at any stage of your work, at the beginnings, you are sending your work to different people to look at, to add notes to, keep a record of all that stuff because somebody could see your idea and be quote unquote inspired by it and create a similar thing. So instead of looking at just the whole first to file, look at the first to create and the first to record the creation aspect. That's where at every stage, you can pinpoint where somebody may have benefited or been inspired by or quite frankly stolen from your idea. But it's from jump. It's like, I always tell artists, once you start writing a song, put the lyrics down, email them to yourself. When you update it, email them to yourself. So there's always a record of you working on something. You go to the studio, you have your demo, keep a copy. All these are important because they establish a chain of, I guess you say custody, or a chain of provenance. And you need all these things because Look, I can walk with you on, on, on the game tomorrow, Ben, and halfway through it, I go left. If there's no record of what we, we put together on this game, if I find somebody who is smarter than both of us, and I can manipulate me to create a new game that takes your best ideas, and I make money off it, if you haven't documented our interactions, you're done, and I'm rich. But I've stolen, your, I've, I've stolen from your intellectual property. So from the start, get it locked down. Would you agree, though, honey, would you agree that there are some things that are going to be really hard to protect? I mean, we're forever sharing non-disclosure agreements when we go to various studios and show certain ideas and try and have certain game concepts written. I work with a couple of uh, pinball and arcade companies. They have patents protecting certain new innovations in technology. But, uh, you know, certain concepts uh, are kind of, it's, it's like when you see a movie from DreamWorks come out at the same time that a movie from Warner Brothers comes out, oh, I want to say uh, a number of years ago, there were so many films that came out on ants. Do you remember all the animated ants movies? Yeah simultaneously and there was no suing you know they were creatives coming up with almost you know identical concepts creative concepts almost. from different yeah. studios at the same time almost you're right um, the almost is where lawyers make their money and creative creatives lose their money so i'll use the example of um the titanic no, no sorry no, sorry not the titanic um, well, 20, 20 years ago, I'm showing my age, there were two movies about Wyatt, Wyatt Earp. One by Kevin Costner and one um, starring um, Kurt Russell. Wyatt Earp and Tombstone. It was the same historical character. What was different, and this is where copyright comes into the expression, the Tombstone movie was largely about the famous gunfight at the OK Corral. Whereas Kevin Costner's version of Wyatt, Wyatt, Wyatt Earp was more about Wyatt's life becoming the sheriff. Now, at that point, there's a very clear divide. These two ideas are different. It's the same subject matter. So it's like having two novels about, two biographies about Donald Trump. You know, one could be um, in a hagiographic style, the other could be in a first person. It is the expression. Copyright doesn't protect the idea. It protects the expression of the idea. So that way I can, I can make a car tomorrow, I can make a car tomorrow, but a tank, a, hum, a Humvee is different from a, a Carrera. They are both cars. They both move people around, but they are differences. And I keep on saying this. 
it is an exhaustive process and you can never protect everything. But you should try to protect everything. That way, you have enough room that in the, in the event something comes up, you have a stronger case. And the truth is a lot of things are not as difficult as they appear. You make a game. Anyone can make a game. What's your game about? How many players? What is special about your game? So the creative process will think about his, his, his creation as a business vehicle. What is special about your idea besides the fact that you like it? Because, you know, people like different things, but the, the ultimate determinant of quality is the market. That is why some really great artistic movies fail and some really, really crap movies succeed. It's the market, but you have to get to market. And to get to market, you have to have something that can be put before the public. And for that, you must protect what you have. So in the event that it actually succeeds, you don't lose out. And I think there's no getting around Sorry, I'm a bit passionate about this. There's no getting around the fact that you must protect what you create, unless you want somebody else to take the benefit of your hard work and you are just the guy who made the great idea. If, if you're happy with that, if you're truly a creative and you want to make money, don't protect yourself. Let the business person come in and take all the money and just, and just say, well done, buddy. <laughs> Great, um, Paul. Um, any opinion on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's uh, we, we, we touched a, a bit of, uh, upon this earlier. The difficulty to protect certain elements. For example, uh, if you're de developing a game, well, uh, let's say you want to have a space-related game. Well, of course, you're going to be using aliens, spaceships, spacesuits, uh, uh, planets, and so forth. But then those those can't be copyrighted and uh, that's the difficulty, right? You can have characters like ants, uh, which uh, you know, which evolve in 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 any given world, and uh, certainly uh, you you could argue that well, the fact that the, that those movies all came out at the same time certainly seems to indicate that there is some uh, copying or inspiration going on, but then. Because the storyline was different, because even the art uh, design, uh, th th there were there were lots of uh, uh, differences between the, the between these different movies. Well, uh, that, that's the reason why there was no litigation uh, to, uh, have, um, in relation to those, because certainly there was the, the timing was suspicious. Uh, but then the the differences were such that uh, there was clearly no grounds to, to, to initiate the lawsuit. And that's the one of the difficulties about uh, protecting your, your your work as a creator is the, the fact that uh, if someone else is able to sufficiently distinguish what they're doing from what you, what you have done, then yeah, there may be lots of similarities and maybe as a creator you feel that uh, this is clearly uh, copying uh, because um, uh, you thought about this now uh, for the past few years nobody has come up with this 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 type of idea and suddenly after you you did it some other people are doing it and yeah it's it's unfortunate uh, but then uh, it, it's going to be quite difficult to to have a solid uh, case uh, unless you can show for example they copied uh, the character. The the background is similar. Maybe they copy. Uh, I I don't know. Uh, the the world. Uh, the world is the same. Maybe they have copied. Uh, I don't know. For example, if you have uh, a house or a castle or, or or whatever, if you can show that they copied so many different elements, then you would have a a strong case. But then, just a general idea, that's going to be very difficult to protect. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, so something that is very um, keen to our industry is that uh, you get have um, some, a concept called media storytelling. And that uh, deals with the fact that you create a game, today it goes and sell a million dollars, or that it becomes so popular it gets modeled into a film, or it gets modeled into a toy, or it gets modeled into comics. Um, how does uh, how does a creator um, enrich, how does he protect himself? That's the word I'm trying to find. How does he protect himself and protect his, 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 his um, copyright? In, about... Very Unless good. somebody has ideas of uh, <laughs> topics to, <laughs> to talk about. 
Probably no football. You're still muted. Ben, you're muted. All right. Um, what well, I was trying to get to, uh, I hope everybody can hear me now. No. Hello. Hello. Looks like he's got a dodgy connection. Yeah. Hello. Ben? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Hello? Uh, Benedict is based in Nigeria. Yes. Hello, Ben. All right. <laughs> So I'm here again. Um, sorry about the, 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 the network. We, we do have those um, issues down here. Um, so what I, was, what, I, what I was trying to get to is about derivative works and how any creative can protect the exploitation of such um, future works when at, at the incept, inception of creating that idea, for instance, taking a game I and uh, taking a game and then it sells becomes very popular and then it gets into um, into a film made into a toy line and that sort of thing. So how does any creative protect himself on that? I'm just saying long term, you know, if he could restart whatever device using, I don't know if he's using to connect with a laptop or whatever it is, you know, so he could restart, that would probably solve the problem. Possibly. You know. Okay, Ben. Ben, ben you're yeah, muted again, by the way. All right, so I, I'm back here. Um, network, network issues. Okay. Uh, before you go on, there was, there was a suggestion. Yes, sorry. Before you go on, there, there was a suggestion by someone. Yes. There was a suggestion that maybe you might want to restart, reboot your your laptop or whatever whatever you're using because that might be the problem. All right. Um, I, I guess while you're doing that, if we are still on together, I guess we can probably talk among ourselves and exchange, um, and ask ourselves questions. Um, I would be, I mean, we could take oh. out the creative. Sorry, go on. No, you could go ahead. I, um, I think uh, I'm back. It's just uh, that talk if he issues it down here. So just talking about uh, create, um, protecting derivative works um, in the future, um, how does how can any creative uh, protect himself from exploitation? Especially when uh, a work moves from a, a film, becoming popular as a film, getting into a game, becoming so popular, and then a toy man and a comic decide to come out. A lawyer. Preferably get a lawyer to be part of your company. Because then ah. his, his, his job would be to actually protect the business, but you can't do this stuff without protection. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an old problem with creatives. You focus mostly on the arts and you neglect the business aspect, the legal aspect, the financial aspect in terms of your taxes and everything else until it's too late. So the very first thing is you have an idea, run it by your legal friends, your business friends. If need be, trade some red, some um, some company share and all that, but you can't do it yourself. That's the key thing. Um, it's, 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 it's a recurring question. How do we, how do we, it's very simple. The creative job is to create. Free yourself to create by bringing on board, let me rephrase this, you should see himself or herself as the CEO of their business. The best CEOs delegate. They have the best people in areas they don't understand. To look out for them, your CFO, your CLO, your CI, whatever it is, that leaves you as a CEO to focus on product communication and advocacy. So get a lawyer, get an accountant, get a marketer. That's it. And then you then focus on running the ship with their help. Because it's always going to be a problem that's going to come up. Um, it's always going to be that one person whose contract you did not get. And that person who 
did some after hours feel that because what we do is have someone that documents every single process. That picks it and look, I used to learn the music label. And I found out very early that artists are very, music artists are very, very, especially in this um, modern um, Bluetooth wireless age, they don't keep their data files. So I had to archive their files. And then I had an artist who one day his computer crashed. And he called me, oh my God, oh, all my files are blah, blah, blah. I said, do you want your files? Do you want your files? He says, okay, you know what? Why? Because when you record, submit the CD to me, I back it up. Now, that's what was is here. The artist should look at that aspect or the creative and say, look, I want to do, do who do I want to give me cover? It's not a one man job. Never has been, never will be. It's actually very, it's funny. people forget that it's actually very easy to get things done once you share the process. So do that. That's advice. I only add a thing about derivative works is that when you're with Tiki P and you have licensed an IP, but you are making a creative derivative of that, uh, say you license Star Wars and you come up with, with your storyline and it is considered a derivative work, the IP owner, Lucasfilm, will absolutely let you know clearly whatever you create based on the original property is owned by Lucasfilm. So I, I'm just, everything it kind of just said is so appropriate. And, you know, being a smart creative and surrounding yourself with smart experts in all various fields is critical to your uh, successfully protecting your original work. But in the case of derivative works, I don't know that you can protect derivative works based on a branded IP. They are always normally owned. You can't create something on Star Wars, even if it's new and original, because you didn't come up with the original underlying IP. Uh, I don't know if anybody feels differently about that. But. No, you're absolutely right. I think this is great advice. And uh, this is something which often comes up as well uh, in relation to games, because you often see fans who would decide on their own to, uh, to, to create a remaster of a very old game. Otherwise, they would, for example, uh, I, I see so many of those on a regular basis. Maybe someone says, well, I'm going to recreate uh, Mario 64 on the, on the PC. I'm going to use Unreal Engine. So I'm going to enhance the graphics. I'm going to create everything. But then because you're using the same, uh, un, un, because you're based on the underlying game, uh, what, what happens each and every time we've all failed is that uh, they eventually get a cease and desist uh, letter from uh, the rights holder telling them, well, no, you're not allowed to, to recreate the game. Uh, it may be an old game, but then we, we are still the rights owner and we, you know, we, we, we don't agree to this. And many times, uh, especially if you look at uh, discussion forums or Reddit or whatever, you would always see people who are unhappy, who don't understand. They are saying, well, if you're not using the game, why can't I... Uh, uh, create something based on it, uh, and while I can understand uh, that uh, personal resentment, uh, the the issue is, uh, however, that uh, the the original creator they actually have to enforce their rights because if they don't do it, they're going to lose their rights as well, and uh, that's not something that uh, that anyone wants. Uh, uh, so they have to actually protect uh, their intellectual property because it's a system where if you don't use it, uh, you, you if you don't protect it, you're going to lose it. And uh, this is something which uh, obviously is not uh, uh, doable for, for, for anyone. Okay. Um, I have to disagree. Okay. You go I, ahead. I, I disagree. Again, it's, it's, it's down to, how do I say it? But a lot of people on Reddit, uh, the fans, the geeks, just want to have fun with somebody else's work. But understand that that work that inspired you had not existed, you couldn't build on it. What you can do, and a lot of people do this, is negotiate with the original rights holder to become part of their universe. So then you share credit. It's like, you know what? Um, I'm a comics fan, so I'm going to use comics. Um, if a writer goes to work, 
for example, for um, Marvel or DC, you are working in their Marvel universe. You may create five new characters. They belong, in the old days, they belong strictly to Marvel under, under the um, work for products. As things evolved and expanded, the right of the creator to create his own creation in that world became held as sacrosanct. So now what, what you now see is if you watch Batman or uh, Superman, there is a tag, Superman created by Jerry Schuster and, and, and Ben Siegel for DC. You now have two things. You get the benefit of being in that world and you get your credits and some money, but you have to be willing to have that conversation. And it, it happens a hell of a lot. What you, what you see is a lot of people do this. They do fan created videos which serve as, to be, to be honest, um, adverts or as pretty much unofficial, um, this is the phrase for it, um, show reels for their work. They're saying, uh -huh. look how small I am. I could do this with as work. Yeah, and that guy now goes, yeah, but you didn't have permission to do it. Now, it's a bit more tedious to write and say, look, I want to do this with your work. Here's an idea. Here's what I want to do with it. If they say no, then you go away and you know to create your entire new work in the new universe. If they say yes, and you've explained why, but again, there are a lot of um, exceptions to that, 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 that protect these, um, I'll call them unofficial spin offs. There's the fair use, face exemptions, there are, there, are, there are different exemptions. You've got to find the one that works for you. So when you write to them, go look, hey, there's no money involved in this, there's this, there's that. It's not for anything else, and um, I will give you all credits. Once you've done that on average, for them it's, if this goes further, hey, we can always tell the guy, you know what, well, you, you did this thing with our work, let's talk a deal or let's buy you out. But then you gain your notoriety, you gain your legitimacy, but you have to start out wanting to work with the system. You can't game the system. And a lot of creatives who go down that route want to take, they want to benefit from somebody else's work to and sell their work and they don't want to share and they miss the fact that it's a business which is why i say again get a lawyer get a marketing person get someone to understand negotiations because a simple letter or email to the right department gets you what you want it's the same way people use people use a lot of like jingles and stuff for charity purposes and the rest write to the person and say i want to use this for this purpose i will not go against your original intention for the work. I am respecting your intellectual property rights. I want to advance them in this way. And we can talk profit share or dividend. And if it takes off, a smart business will go, that's a new market for us. It's easier to co-op this person in this area. So that always works. Okay. Thank you, Yohane. Um, any other opinion on that? Okay. Um, uh yeah, I think we we are actually all in agreement uh, that yeah you you cannot just decide oh this is in, uh, this uh, game is interesting and therefore I'm going to reproduce it uh, or, or remaster it or whatever uh, on, on your own you actually of course do need to get the approval and in some cases <laughs> it's going to be extremely difficult of course to get any uh, any approval right if you want to uh, uh, to reach out to one of the big game companies. Uh, more more likely than not, they're going to, to, to turn you down and say uh, no. And yeah, in, in, in those cases, well, uh, you cannot just say, oh, well, I'm just going to go ahead and create it uh, and post some videos online and I'm going to do it free of charge. And since I'm not making any benefit, any profit out of it, uh, uh, that's fine. No, it's, it's, it's not fine, actually, uh, uh, because, uh, well, the reason why you chose uh, to use uh, this uh, uh, license character, license universe, or, or, or game, or whatever, is because, well, it has some notoriety attached to it. People know it. And uh, that's something that, of course, uh, uh, courts would, would, would say that, well, you derive some benefit out of it, right? Because uh, uh, you could have done, you could have created an, another, uh, another game, another visual, or whatever, based on your own work. But then the fact that you chose to reproduce, for example, a Star Wars character, well, that's uh, because, well, you, you, you intend to, to rely not only on the existing universe, but then you also want to, to rely on the fact that it has a certain notoriety. People 
like uh, that universe and therefore you get a benefit out of it. All right. Um, so um, what, what, what I get from all this is that um, certain, certain processes and, um, and uh, in fact, recruitment basically needs to happen um, at, 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 as the idea progresses um, from the concept stage into the production to, to, to avoid um, missed um, opportunities. Um, which is great because uh, Jermaine, I'm sure this is an area where you cover in terms of publishing and um, pitching to, to uh, investors, um, how best uh, can indies or small time studios, uh, what, what, how best can they pitch to investors, what they should look at, what, what, what are the sites that you feel that they may be exposed, that you think that they should cover um, when trying to pitch? And uh, in terms of um, trying to get uh, funding from those investors and um, trying to explain to them their marketing strategy, what do, you, what do you feel that should be explained to those investors? Uh, explain to the investors or the developers? Because... To the publishing team, right? The team who's going to publish the idea. Right. Well, the publishing, game publishing has just changed so much, even in just the last couple of years, publishers are so loath to spend all of the money that to develop a game from scratch. Now everybody wants to see a vertical slice or they, they want to know that they're working with a team that's uh, got a viable engine, et cetera. So it's, it's not so easy these days to say the least to go out and get investment on a game. Sometimes we're seeing people are doing very well by themselves to bootstrap a little bit, demonstrate capabilities of a team, and then ultimately also demonstrate how they intend to aggregate audiences. Lately, this seems to be the most costly part of ongoing game development uh, beyond anything. The, the, especially for a live game, the cost of uh, at getting and keeping and churning audiences can be just as costly ongoing after development is finished. So it's the ongoing costs of a game. So I think I start out by looking at the concept of a game, at looking at what the base engine technology of the game is. Is the team experienced at all? Do they intend to layer on an IP? Is this original game development? If it is original game development, um, what are the differentiating factors for the marketplace? What's going to get their game to stand out? There are just so many factors that I feel like go into consulting with a new development team or with new development efforts to try and secure investment. I, I know I'm all over the place and I hope I'm, I'm helping narrow the field to a little bit, but it's a conundrum these days. It's not easy to get game development as you and I have talked to before. And the likes of the Marvels, the likes of the Warner Brothers, the very big established IP, they're looking to work now with existing and experienced teams. And they want to know that they're gonna be working with companies that are gonna get through to the finish line because it's so costly from a legal perspective, from product development and management perspective, game development, like any development, it just takes time. And uh, are you gonna put all of your eggs into getting up and started a totally new team? It's not to say it can't be done, it's just that many more hurdles that a brand new team needs to get over to prove themselves um, worthy of the money they're gonna have to spend up front, of the ongoing costs and of getting to the finish line and marketing to this audience. Right. Have I just made it <laughs> overwhelming? <laughs> well, 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 it, 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 it's close. It's close to where we really want to go to. Um, Paul, I know you dealt with um, in one of your articles that I saw you dealt um, talked about loot boxes 
and new merchandising items for for games. Um, how how can any indie protect um, um, revenue streams from such from the commercial sale of loot boxes, especially with uh, known titles that um, we know the League of Legends, uh, most of the esports brands that we see these days. Um, um, loot boxes become um, a serious thing. Eh? Over even when you think about in terms of casual games and and, and mobile games. Um, so how best can can we think about about protecting revenues from 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 merchandising like that? Uh, yeah, in relation in relation to uh, loot boxes, uh, that's actually a very uh, tricky minefield. And uh, uh, if if you are a game developer and you're looking at ways to monetize a game, I would actually recommend that you steer clear away from uh, 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 from loot boxes at this stage because it's uh, it, it, it is, it's a highly controversial area uh, at, at the moment, especially in uh, in Europe and. Uh, uh, just to give you some examples as to what I'm meaning by controversial, uh, you have, for example, uh, uh, the UK government, which is running a consultation right now, actually, uh, and the consultation ends uh, uh, on the 24th of November in relation to how... Uh, the, so the UK government is trying to collect opinion as to how what is being done, uh, what are the issues in relation to loot boxes, uh, what do people think about it. Uh, and uh, the, the issue, of course, is that uh, loot boxes, as it currently stands, looks a lot like, uh, like gambling because, well, you are investing either virtual currency or even reward money into something and you don't really know what you're getting. So in case some of you don't really know what a loot box is, it's, it's it's like a box, a crate, or, or or however you you design it. And when you purchase this box, you don't really know what's inside. You you know it's something which which can be used in the game, but it can be it can be anything. And uh, so you you decide that you want to acquire this box, and uh, you take a chance, and uh, maybe you're lucky and you have a an item which is very rare, or maybe you're not so lucky and uh, you, you end up with something which uh, which is quite generic. Uh, and uh, this is highly uh, uh, controversial at the moment because uh, uh, you have lots of reports, uh, for example, in the United Kingdom, where you have uh, gamers who say, well, I've invested uh, uh, 100,000 in the in loot boxes on, on, on FIFA, for example, and uh, I've I've used all my savings on it, and uh, I, I don't have any anything uh, any, anything left. And the the issue is that because it looks a lot like a game of chance, you're investing money in it and so forth. Uh, uh, there is this concern that uh, yeah maybe it creates addiction, maybe it's gambling and so forth. And uh, uh, it, it, it's certainly an area where uh, there is a lot of scrutiny uh, in, in this respect. Uh, last year, the US FTC has also uh, examined the issue about uh, uh, loot boxes. There was a workshop uh, which was conducted and a lot of game companies were invited to uh, to present their views. And uh, at this stage, at least, the FTC has said, well, we're not going to take any action because um, we don't think that there is a huge issue which requires us taking any action, but we are continuously monitoring the area. And the reason why uh, the uh, the US FTC has said, well, uh, things look okay for the moment is that there has been a lot of self-regulation uh, which has taken place over the past few months. Uh, you have, for example, disclosure of uh, loot boxes on game boxes, and so now Peggy ratings uh, and so forth, they do require that uh, if you sell a game on consoles, or on PC or whatever, you have to actually disclose whether you have loot boxes. Uh, this doesn't exist yet for mobile games, it's, so it's not a legal requirement that you have to disclose it, but then what you have now is that uh, you have on app stores like uh, Apple or Google, they actually do now mention that uh, uh, there are in-app purchases and so forth, so you do have now those disclosures which are in place. Some countries, they require that uh, the game developer discloses the odds of winning, so you have one chance out of I don't know how many million to uh, to win a rare item or whatever. So in some countries you have to disclose it, and in some cases you actually have uh, game developers who who have to to disclose it based on the platform where they choose to to publish the game. And 
um, it, it seems as well that uh, game console manufacturers, the Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony, they have also pledged that uh, there's going to be more transparency uh, in relation to in-app purchases uh, and, and in particular loot boxes. But then uh, another reason why I'm saying that uh, you, you should steer clear from, from loot boxes is that in some countries, the uh, loot boxes are banned. Uh, they, they are banned because they, the, the, the regulator has said, no, loot boxes for us meets uh, the definition of gambling. And uh, uh, if you do decide that you want to, uh, to go ahead, uh, uh, you're going to get a fine. Uh, and uh, that's why you have a number of game developers, uh, Nintendo, uh, uh, Square Enix, and so forth. They have chosen that, uh, yeah, they're going to remove certain games from, uh, for example, uh, app stores in uh, Belgium, in the Netherlands, and, uh, and, and so forth, because those games have been... Uh, yeah, those games include loot boxes, and because they are not in line with local legislation, well, uh, they chose to, to, to remove it. And then very recently as well, uh, uh, the, the, you have this uh, case very recently because it was just at the end of last month. Uh, you have this uh, ruling from, uh, from a judge in the Netherlands, and uh, they actually fined Electronic Arts uh, uh, I, I think it was something about 500,000 uh, 500, euros um, so a significant amount of money because uh, the, uh, the Dutch court uh, considered that uh, the loot boxes in the FIFA, uh, FIFA game uh, are a violation of uh, Dutch uh, gambling laws. So it's, it's, a, it's an area which, um, w w which is still controversial. And um, we have to remember as well that uh, loot boxes came at the center of the attention uh, uh, a, a while ago, also with Electronic Arts, when they decided to launch uh, Battlefront 2, uh, which uh, which was controversial because uh, initially, at least, there was uh, this mechanic where if you wanted to acquire certain uh, uh, s certain characters, so if you wanted to play uh, Luke Skywalker or whatever, well, you had to uh, you had, initially uh, you had to. Uh, uh, to acquire those uh, those boxes if you didn't know what you had and maybe you're lucky and you ended up with Luke Skywalker or maybe you just ended up with something else. And uh, that mechanic changed, of course, uh, after a while because there was a huge controversy. Uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was big backlash actually. And uh, uh, the game a, a few weeks afterwards was, was significantly changed so you don't have those loot box mechanics. But then, the damage was already done because you had a lot of uh, public resentment, uh, and you had, and and that's the reason why you had this regulatory uh, uh, scrutiny because uh, uh, the fact that you had a popular license. Uh, so I'm trying to tie it back <laughs> against the licensing. You had this popular license of Star Wars, uh, and which was. Uh, bringing in those uh, uh, gambling characteristics to a popular game uh, did not help. And uh, that, in, in my view, at least, there was a, a lot of resentment which was uh, created because of this, even though it was unjustified. But yeah, that's that, that's what happened. And um, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I, I don't want to monopolize uh, the, the, the session as well. But then I, I will just end by saying that, uh, yeah, loot boxes is a topic uh, which is controversial in a number of countries and uh, it, it depends on where you want to, to launch your game. Uh, if you're launching your game in select countries, uh, then in, in the, if those countries do not uh, uh, have any prohibition against loot boxes, then yeah, uh, uh, you know, you, you could go ahead. But then I suspect that won't be the case. I suspect that uh, as a game developer, of course, you want to reach a global audience. And uh, either you decide to tailor your game to each different market, which I think is not a, a, a feasible approach, or otherwise, if you want to launch your game globally, the, the easiest approach would probably to just, well, find other mechanisms to, uh, to monetize your game. For example, uh, maybe you, you could have advertisements in, in the case of a mobile game, maybe or otherwise in, in the case of other games, it would be through uh, cosmetic items, uh, uh, for example, costumes, uh, different colors that you can personalize or whatever, or, or DLCs or, or, or something else. But then loot boxes uh, in, in many countries is uh, viewed very negatively.
All right, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we are getting to the end of our session. Um, just one more question, and then I'll ask the audience if they have any other um, questions they want to ask, and then we proceed with to end. Uh, so um, the next question that comes to mind is um, royalties and negotiation um, through audits. Now I know in terms of uh, the, 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 the gaming industry, we have some sort of royalties in place and, and how publishers and the developers can sit and audit uh, the performance of their title. Now I don't know whether this is the same kind of practice in films and even the same kind of practice in, in animation. Um, Jermaine or Ihana, you can uh, please answer to that. Well, that could be a session in and of itself. <laughs> that one question. Uh, I would only say these days that deals are not all the same anymore. There used to be real standards. And, and I feel like in this day and age, it really is, uh, I'm finding it is uh, by deal, uh, by platform, by IP. Uh, needless to say as well, in terms of royalty checking and audits, um, I see in every deal that we do that there is a percentage that is by right. You will pay if you are in the fault of withholding royalties or you will, uh, the other, uh, the, the licensor will have to pay if they double check and you are not under reporting royalties. So there are all kinds of stipulations that people are putting in place to just verify the royalties. These days, um, in mobile, certainly, there are lots of staggered royalties depending on how much marketing is put in. So the more marketing support a licensor is giving, very possibly the closer to 50-50 they're sharing in back-end royalties. But in some cases, they just want to license their rights. And then we are paying as low as 10% in royalties. So really, whether it's console, PC, uh, t-shirts, toys, pinball arcade, depending on the consumer product or the game platform, depending on the relationship with the brand, depending on a whole host of factors and what I put in versus you put in, uh, is De depends a lot on how much of the royalty of the back end of an advance of a guarantee that you get. So again, a very wishy-washy answer to say that so much depends on the specific deal that you're doing. All right, thank you. Um, Ihane, I don't know if you have any opinion on that. Uh, it's an old saying, um, you, get, you get what you negotiate, not what you deserve. Um, and your, your negotiating hand is strengthened by, I guess, the degree of information you have about the deal, who you are dealing with and all that. Um, there isn't much, look, it's, it's, it's gonna come down to, honestly, what do you as a creative want out of it? Is this a short-term or long-term thing? Um, what do you get out of this deal with the other part, be it a publisher, be it a licensing, whatever it is. <clears throat> um, but yeah, look, there is no standard. Um, I've I, I spent that much music in the team. Once it's contrast saying it's is what can we get away with, and then um, how can you make sure that you're not unquote um, unduly taking advantage of? And I guess that's where it comes down to your knowledge your value and your, re and your realism about what that value is, you know, because <laughs> look, uh, they're looking more for ready-made products now, you know, it's easier for them because then all they do is increasingly, increasingly companies don't want to get involved in R&D, they want to get involved in marketing and merchandising. So, if you, if you come to, to um, the publisher and you are fresh off the boat, as they say, you will get pennies on the job. But if you have an established market, an established degree of um, provenance, you can talk a bit more. You can also say, well, you know what? I want to license to deal with points over this period of time. And then you can work in things like your, your, um, your rights to renegotiate and all that based on 
your um, your out and so no, how to tell what is great business will want of a business partner that's bringing in the money. They will sit down and say, look, let's, what can we do to make you happy? But you, you never get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. That's a basic rule in your first deal or two. It is what it is. All right, thank you. Okay, there's nothing we to build in. Oh, sorry. Certain, certain, sorry. Go ahead. There's nothing we need to build in. I don't know, even building key man clauses, um, performance related um, opt outs, all those. But again, you, you need a lawyer to do this, to do these things. So again, it's a lawyer. But going looking for pretty much your know, break even royalty points, a timeline for royalty um, deliverables, your accounting, uh, with accounting expert or firm. I, I, I mentioned like accountants ages ago. Make sure you have all these things, and then they can advise you on what to negotiate for. That way, you know when you're being underpaid. You know when there are things that get in the way. Also, try and look out for hmm, force majeure exceptions, because right now we're dealing with, with the pandemic. How will that affect in terms of your revenue? Because more people are playing this now than they were before. You know, you have the foresight to put something like that into your, you know, in the event that there is some global situation that it's get a, get a lawyer get a, get a lawyer it's as simple as that all right thank you everyone thank you everyone this has, <laughs> simple. This, this has been a, a great learning session for me and i'm sure for many of our, our attendees um just let me open the floor to anyone does anyone have a question i want to ask any, any part of our, our panelists on this we'll just allow two questions so that we can quickly close. Um, and then we can share emails of uh, everybody in case you want to further contact with them. All right. So just summarize it. Um, I think the longer short of this all is uh, whether you are in animation, whether you're in gaming, whether you're in film, uh, and you're creating content, local market or foreign market, I think you just have to find a lawyer and go on a journey with that lawyer. That's the long and short of it. Because um, there's no stage where you won't be exposed to certain legalities, certain practices or certain um, demands by whether your publisher, whether by your competitor, whether by anybody in short. Um, so uh, that's my final take. I would like to thank um, Germain Joya for joining us, Paul Lanois, and Ihane Ahibe. Um, Ahibe, sorry, for joining us. Please, if you want to get in touch with them or you want to get in touch with me, you can send me an email at creativepixelacademy at gmail.com. Um, the panelists can give out their email in case if you want to get in touch with them. Um, Please go ahead if you want to share your email. I'm fine. Go ahead. Sure. All right. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, this is our last session for 2020. Um, so with uh, this session, we call it, uh, we call 2020 uh, closes. Um, this was a soft launch for Creative Pixel Academy. Next year, we, we hopefully we will get back to this um, interview sessions and then we could possibly try and start uh, our open classes. But that is still in the plan. But thank you everybody for joining. Um, thank you very much. This, is, this has been a 10 year pregnancy of mine. And today, <laughs> at least I, I, see some, I see some efforts to it. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank All you right. very much for having me as well. All right. Thank you, everyone.